Space, the final frontier. This is the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. Its mission to explore the solar system, to seek out new observations and data, to boldly go where no podcast has gone before. And now the host of the Observer's Notebook, Tim Robertson. Hello and welcome to the Observer's Notebook, the official podcast of the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers. My name is Tim Robertson, the host of the podcast and also the coordinator of the training program. Thanks for downloading and listening. This episode is an encore performance from one I recorded way back in 2018 with the late Don Mackholtz. It was his first appearance on the podcast and his recent passing has made me want to uh, relive this podcast and my conversation with him. Don was a great guy and a good friend. And I wanted to share this podcast again with you if you, in case you hadn't heard it. Uh, I've also been taking a little bit of a break from podcasting, a little recharge, a few vacations. I recently retired, uh, but I'm getting back at it and I'm starting to record a new podcast now. In fact, we have a very uh, fun series coming up, Historic Observatories. So stay tuned for that and hope you enjoy this episode of The Observer's Notebook. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everybody back to the Observer's Notebook podcast. I'm speaking today with a very special guest, uh, Don Mackholtz. He's the past coordinator of the comet section of the ALPO, and he's also discovered 11 comets. I I believe that's a current number. And uh, past recipient of the Walter Haas Observer's Award for the ALPO. Welcome to the podcast, Don. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Nice nice to talk to you. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. um, so why don't you give everybody a little bit more background about yourself before we get into it? Well, I've been involved in amateur astronomy since uh, I was probably about eight years old. Began with a pair of binoculars and some star maps and learned my way around the sky. Got my first telescope, a two-inch refractor, at the age of 13, and then the six-inch criterion um, when I was 16. Oh, the old Found RV-6? Up- yes, the old RV-6. Uh, I had one of those, too. I loved it. A good telescope. I discovered my 10th comet with it and uh, found all the Messe objects within one year and uh, began doing some astrophotography uh, using single lens reflex, mostly black and white, developing the film myself and sending it off to magazines, mostly the smaller magazines. One called Observer's Sky would uh, print quite a few. Um, went into the Army 71, came out in 1974, and I wanted to do a project in astronomy that would keep me looking at the sky. Mm-hmm. And um, had several options. One is variable stars. Now, that, that, that's a good one. It's a good setup uh, program already and uh, <clears throat> fairly easy to get into. The other would be monitoring asteroids, uh, estimating their magnitudes so that you could determine rotational periods. And the third project I considered was, was comet hunting, and I, and I chose comet hunting. I uh, began comet hunting systematically on January 1st, uh, 1975, after doing about 20 or 25 hours over the previous three or four years. And in the final few months prior to 1975, I perfected ways of comet hunting and sweeping patterns and stuff like that. I've been comet hunting ever since, over 8,200 hours. Oh, my goodness. Comet hunting. <laughs> I've been out every month, at least one hour a month uh, for the last 514 months. And um, discovered 11 named comets. Also picked up periodic comet DeVico when it came back. Um, I, I've had several occupations. I'm still employed. Um self-employed right now as a real estate appraiser. I've been doing that now for about 15 years. I work about 60, 70 hours a week, and most of the work's done out of my home. Of course, you do have to inspect properties and see the comparables, so I'm usually out of the house about once a day for a couple hours, and the rest of the time's at home. 60 to 70 hours a day? A week? A week, yeah. Yeah, I keep And you have time for comet observing? (laughs) <laughs> yes, 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 I do. Well, that's done at night. Yeah. And, uh, so you don't you sleep. Know, I, I don't get a lot of sleep. 
Yep. I've been blessed with the ability to get by on less sleep than most people. Yeah. I have a degree in laser technology. I did uh, I did that from about 1984 until um, 20, well, about the year 2002 or so, hmm. uh, when I switched to become a real estate appraiser. Uh, worked with lasers and optics for many years. Prior to that, I worked with eyeglasses and made eyeglasses and stuff like that. So. I've had a few different occupations. I, I really enjoy being a real estate appraiser. I turned 65 just a few months ago. Well, and, happy birthday. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And I've lived here in Koufax for uh, the last 25 years prior to that in uh, San Jose area and uh, prior to that in Concord, California. And those three locations is where most of my astronomy has developed, um, beginning in Concord and then over in San Jose for 15 years and here for the last 25, 26 years in Colfax. Hmm. Now, getting into your uh, comet searching, you, you, okay, you mentioned you used the 6-inch reflector for your 10th comet? Yes, that's correct. What, what type of equipment have you used to search? Well, I've used several different instruments, but I began with a four and a quarter inch reflector, F5, from a company called Superior Optics. And that gave about a two and a half degree field of view. And I used that for about the first year. And uh, about halfway through the first year, I ordered a 10 inch telescope mirror from Coulter, F3.8, and I built the telescope around it. I began to use that around October of uh, 1975. And I used that for about the next 25, 30 years. Hmm. I discovered four comets with the 10-inch F, F4 reflector. Then I built a pair of binoculars using aerial photography lenses. Uh, these are Old War surplus ones. The front objective is 6.2 inches across. Oh my the goodness. back, uh, it's got five elements. Each, each uh, lens has five elements and weighs 22 pounds. <sighs> The back element is about four and a half inches across, so it acts like about a five, five and a half inch uh, pair of binoculars. And I built that in 1983, and I discovered four comets with that. I used another one of those lenses. In fact, I have several of those aerial photography lenses, and I built a telescope with a uh, w one objective, a single telescope, not binoculars, with a eyepiece giving about a three and a half degree field and discovered my my fifth comet with that instrument and then the, the tenth one was with the criterion six inch dinoscope and then in the past 11 years i've been using an 18 inch f uh, f 4.8 reflector here in colfax uh, and i found my most recent comet in, in 2010 using that instrument yeah. Now, I want to remind our listeners, uh, every single one of these discoveries were visual, right? Correct. You had no, Correct. no CC imaging, no going to the Catalina Sky Survey and looking at, uh, at photos from there. But these are all things that you s witnessed with your naked eye, looking through the telescope. Right. I, I, you know, I do it the old-fashioned way. I continue to search the old-fashioned way, and... Um... I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the view through the night sky, and I enjoy the challenge. Of course, now it's even a bigger challenge to visually discover a comet. None has been visually discovered since 2010. Yeah, I want and, to talk to you about that. That's because it's yeah. hasn't it taken kind of the fun out of searching. Well, you, you know, you won't yield as many discoveries, mm -hmm. and at the same time, there's fewer people searching visually. Oh. In fact, almost nobody is visually searching anymore. But there's still some areas of the sky that are, are not covered very well by the big search programs. And I believe that there are comets with particular orbits that can get through that big network out there and um, could still be discovered visually. Yeah, I remember one year we, I was at uh, Riverside Telescope Makers Conference and you were up there and you discovered a comet that what was that your second comet or yes my yeah. second comet in uh may 27th 1985 yeah. yes yeah that was that was all the buzz up there that weekend <laughs> i remember yeah. that that was pretty crazy yeah yeah now let's go back to your first one 
Yes. Can you do you remember? I'm sure that's pretty ingrained in your brain. Uh, what the feeling was like, what you were doing, where you found it. Yes. Uh, so September twelfth, nineteen seventy eight, <laughs> at uh, five sixteen in the morning. And you sure it wasn't was five seventeen in the morning. It was. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I was uh, searching the morning sky uh, from Loma Prieta. Uh, when I lived in San Jose and Los Gatos, I commuted 40 minutes each way to a mountain called Loma Prieta in the Santa Cruz mountain range. And I set up my telescope at the, about the 3,200 foot level, well, just along the side of the dirt road. Did that for 15 years, did the Messe marathons from there. Uh, a really wonderful site. Would 1976, I was there about 200 times that year. Uh, but typically about 100 times a year, I would drive there, and most of my sessions were done in the morning. That particular morning, it was uh, fairly windy, and I set up and covered a couple of northern areas, and then I thought, okay, I've still got half hour or so. So I began sweeping a southern area, um, which would have been from 20 degrees declination south in the southeastern sky. Uh, beginning at six hours right ascension. So I began sweeping at six hours, 42 minutes or so. You've got the star Cirrus at minus 16 and a half degrees or so. So I thought, okay, I'll, I'll sweep a little bit further north. I'll begin a little bit further north just so I pick up the star Cirrus, and then I'll kind of know where I am in mm -hmm. RA as I'm working my way down toward the horizon. And uh, I remember seeing the star Cirrus. Okay, I know where I am. It's started moving the telescope south and about two degrees later picked up a little fuzzy object and I thought okay could this be glare a reflection or anything and as I moved the telescope around it seemed to be a real object up there in the sky now by then I knew the sky well enough to know there should not be anything fuzzy there at 11th magnitude 10 and a half magnitude how many hours and had you logged up to this point seven seventeen hundred exactly <sighs> And um, and I th and with many of these these comets, the first thought within a couple seconds is, this is a new comet. Really, uh, it comes that fast because you know the sky that comet. well for spending that many hours. You you yes, know where all it, the faint fuzzies are at. <laughs> you know where the faint fuzzies are at, and you see something that you you know sh shouldn't be there, and you think, well. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, I better stop and examine this thing because I'm not familiar with this. This looks like it could be a new comet. And so I uh, checked to make sure I was where I was in the sky because you need the coordinates to communicate mm -hmm. to the Smithsonian Observatory. And you have to plot it on the map. So I got out my Scalnate Plaiso Atlas Field um, Desk Edition and plotted where it was. I still have that map and really? uh, had to measure the coordinates off of that to send it to the Smithsonian. So I I did that and I thought, okay, now we are going to wait to see if it moves because a comet will move against the background sky mm -hmm. with, and you can usually notice it within about a half hour. But when I picked it up, it was at the moment of astronomical twilight. So the sky was beginning to brighten I watched it for about 20, 30 minutes until it faded from view due to twilight, and I could not really detect any motion for sure. And the Smithsonian, even back in 1978, was, you know, they don't want false reports, and right. they don't want you to, and I don't want to report something that isn't really there, or, you know, you want to make sure it moves. If it moves, then it's, then it's a comet. Whether it's known or not, they can determine that, but, you know... And so I, I went home, made my notes, put together the telegram, thought about it most of the day, and then that night sent the telegram to the Smithsonian. And um, I thought, okay, I, I have to send it before tomorrow morning because I'm going to go out again tomorrow morning and see where it is. And if I send it after the second morning, they might not believe I saw it the first morning. Ah. That might make a difference if someone else is out there right. sweet. So I sent it that night, went out the next morning, uh, picked it up again. It was moving south about a degree a day. Your and heart I must thought, have jumped. This is it. Yeah, I thought this is, a, this is a comet. Now I've sent it to the Smithsonian. I knew pretty much what the known comets were, and I was receiving telegrams at that time whenever one was discovered visually. So I had not received anything. So the only 
the only catch could be that maybe someone had seen it a day or two before me and it had not yet been confirmed or something, but that wasn't the case at all. It was a brand new discovery. The European Southern Observatory did a confirmation photo and I got a call from Dr. Marzen saying it's been oh, confirmed. Wow. The comet, Comet Mockles. Very good. Very oh. happy feeling. Oh, I <laughs> bet. That must have been pumped. Now, between your first and second comet discovery, how many hours did you log? 1,742. Again, so I see a trend. Yeah. But, that, <laughs> yeah, well, but, but your shortest was what? Well, 46 hours. In 1994, I was blessed with three visual comet discoveries in just over four months. That's crazy. I don't know what I did different. I just did the same thing I always do, and I discovered three comets within just over four months. And one of them took only 56 or 46 hours to find. From, yeah. from the previous one. That's crazy. But, uh, now, okay, you, you talk about sweeping. Can you talk about a little bit, little bit about your process for uh, scanning the sky? Obviously, you're not doing the entire sky at night. Mm, no, but there were some some months in 70, 1976, 77, 78, 79, 80, in which I covered, in some months, almost the whole sky, uh, North Pole down to the, as far south as I could go, and east all the way through opposition over to the west and that would take about 30 40 hours to do that but um, the way i do it i look through the eyepiece and i slowly sweep the sky i keep the telescope in continuous motion and i'm looking for a fuzzy object and that does take some practice mm -hmm. and i've used i i developed an eyepiece with a 105 degree field or so but when you get out near the edge of the field, you can't, you don't, you can miss things. So, right. the most practical fields, usually 50, 60, 80, up to 80 degrees, that you can catch at the same time. And so, I'm, I'm looking for a fuzzy object. And of course, you pick up a lot of galaxies and clusters and stuff like that. I sweep usually in only one direction. Uh, when I had an equatorial mount, I swept uh, from near the equator, usually away from the equator. And when I got to the end of the sweep area, which for the for the ten inch telescope was twenty degrees and with the big binoculars was about forty to sixty degrees. Because hmm. I could sweep faster with the binoculars, even though the field of view was about the same. You're using two eyes, the contrast is better. Oh, I see. Well, I get to the end, I swing it back to the, near the beginning, and then move the move the instrument half a field or so down. So and you're using like an alta azimuth mount then, that makes it easier to do that? Yes, yes. Although with the equatorial mount, I would uh, do it too, and it's just, you're sweeping high in the northern part of the sky and a little bit lower as you move further south. It can get a bit uncomfortable, but you know, you get used to it. Mm. Yeah, I would, I, I would assume that when you're looking for a comet, it's either shortly after sunset or before sunrise, because that's usually when comets are their brightest when they're closest to the sun. But what you're telling me now is you, you'll sweep anytime, basically. Well, well, back in those days, there was no major coverage of the sky ah. by the search program, so the whole sky was available to us. True. Photographically, comets were being found mainly around opposition. But they were usually byproducts of other programs, and mm -hmm. we knew we knew that, and we were competing against those. But but you're right; most most comets are found within 60, 70 degrees of the sun, and they're usually brightest at that point, and they're usually brightening more quickly at that point. And um, you, you, the two areas to search are in the western sky after the sun has mm -hmm. gone down, and the sky begins to brighten. I mean, to darken. Mm -hmm. And in the morning sky before before twilight in the east, and the western sky is not favored as much because comets. Well, for one thing, comets can be found in any part of the sky at any time by anybody. And if you remember that, uh, you'll never say that comet hunting is unfair because uh, many. Well, times when someone discovers four or in, in three or four in, in a four month period, I begin to think it's a little unfair. <laughs> <laughs> well, there have been times that I would be out diligently searching, and then, uh, you know, Dennis Milan and Berger mm -hmm. uh, and Kobayashi find find a comet uh, accidentally. 
right. or Alan, Alan Hale and Bob are looking right. at M seventy, and they discover a comet, and they right. weren't looking for comets at the time. And I'm out there searching, and, and and that's just the way it goes. A comet can be found in any part of the sky at any time by anybody, and that's just the the, the way the games played, and and. Um, those that are found in the western sky, however, um, in the evening, generally have been traveling, comets generally travel from east to west. So a comet in that position has already been traveling perhaps through opposition, and the major search programs more than likely would have found those. Okay. Comets in the eastern sky are still moving, many, many of them, east to west. So they're coming out of the solar vicinity where the major search programs still presently do not go. And so a comet can brighten while it's behind the sun. The one I found in 20, uh, 2004 um, had a perihelium distance outside of our orbit. So it was coming in slowly, but it was coming in behind the sun in the solar glare within 30, 40 degrees of the sun and brightening for month after month after month until it finally emerged into the darker sky, southern sky, where I picked it up at 11th magnitude. The one I found in 2010 um, when actually came in from either the north or south was an 89 degree inclination. Wow. And uh, it was also missed by all the search programs because it too brightened when it was in the solar vicinity and then it gets into some darker area where we go on in visually and boom, you can pick it up. And, and I think there are still comets out there that, that are being missed that if we really do a good job of visually searching, we could pick up. Huh. So Just I, a matter of, of getting out there every, every morning and searching. Right. Well, going, as deep as, going as deep as we can. How many, how many, do you know how many visual... Uh, Comet hunters there are right now. There's a there's a few in Japan. Yeah. Um, you know, last last one was found by Ikea. Okay. And then Murakami of Japan. Murakami is still searching. I don't know if Ikea still is. Uh, visually, I don't know if anyone in in the U.S. is except except for me. Yeah. Um, there's just a, a few, and, and I don't blame them. I mean, uh, the yeah. odds the, comp- the odds are, are long. Yeah, the competition's tough with the Kalina Sky <laughs> Survey yeah. and everything else they're doing right now. That's yeah, crazy. I, yeah, they're not I, even I, naming them anymore, I don't think. It's just like, oh, yeah, yeah. here's another I, one. More. I know, and, and the programs are continuing <laughs> to come on board. Now, perhaps, perhaps someday, uh, perhaps someday, uh, these programs will say, you know, we found everything down to 10 meters in size or something, and, uh, you know, these things cost money, so we're going to decommission this program and that program and that program. And, uh, you know, should that ever happen, then the long-period comets coming in are, would be open again to, to, to people like, like me. Hmm. But we don't know if that would ever happen. So you're still out there. I'm still out there. I did about 80 hours or so last year, and I haven't been out yet this year. We've had bad weather the last few days right. and the full moon. Right. But um, I do mostly the morning sky, and uh, I use the 18-inch. I've used the uh, big binoculars a few times this past year, but mostly it's the 18-inch. I can get down to 11 and a half for 12th magnitude when I'm 20, 25 degrees high as I get lower toward the horizon. That goes down to about ten and a half or eleventh magnitude. Hmm. So you, you probably have an internal map of the of the sky in your head that you don't need to look up things anymore if you see anything. Well, when I that that, what, that was true when I was using the ten inch and the big binoculars hmm. because they could see down to about ten and a half, eleventh, eleven and a half. But now I'm using an eighteen inch, and so I have electronic setting circles a little wow. box by Sky Commander sitting right by the eyepiece, and it tells me if there should be something in that field of view. So that makes it easier to identify those 11th, 12th, 13th magnitude things I pick up, sometimes 14th magnitude, um, w- while I'm visually searching. Yeah. Do you want to share any interesting stories you might have on some, any of your discoveries? 
Well, one of the, one of the most interesting comets um, I've ever found was my third third visual comet discovery, May twelfth, nineteen eighty six. And um, at what time? Th- uh, Three fifty three, I believe, in the morning. Okay. And it was only about a half an hour before twilight, so I did see some. I suspected some motion on that one. That was found two a couple degrees south of the Andromeda Galaxy. Oh my! And um, uh, at, at, when I first picked it up, it looked really tiny. So I stopped moving. I was using the big binoculars, and I thought, okay, um, boy, this could be fuzzy. I looked at it really closely, and yes, it was fuzzy. In fact, as I found out later, it had just outburst a little bit the day before. Anyway, this ended up being uh, periodic comet Machotes 1, also known as 96P. And um, it's, it's over the years, it's, a lot of papers have been written on this comet. It uh, goes closer to the sun than any periodic comet on our, that's been around for a while. It's also the brightest periodic comet. Every 5.3 years, it gets to second magnitude. Not even Halley's gets to second magnitude every 77 years. Um, It seems to be responsible for some meteor showers. Oh, really? Yeah. The quads may be the southern Aquarius. And then then there's a daytime meteor shower on June 8th each year. The most um, pop, most... Most number of meteors on any daylight meteor shower is the Ariads, and that's on June 8th of each year, and that is caused by this comet, too. It's also responsible for two families of comets, uh, the uh, Kirk and the Meyer, Marsden, one of those two. But there's a couple different families of comets that seem to have come off of this comet. Now, what do you mean by that? Uh, Sometime in the past... Probably within the last two or three thousand years, uh, this comet broke up, and some bits came off, and they formed other comets. Oh, okay. They're in the same base, the basic orbit. Uh, they are slightly different orbit now. In fact, this this comet uh, has an osculating orbit, and they've tracked it over the decades and centuries, and they figure in nine thousand years this comet's going to crash into the sun. So you know you got nine thousand years still to <laughs> observe it. Uh, but but the orbits are can be traced back to ninety six p, and so it seems to be the origin of that comet. Perhaps the comet of uh, fourteen ninety one might be associated with it too, which uh, no one knows where that comet is anymore. Interesting. But. Um, it, and it might have come from another solar system. Uh, that was announced in 2007 when a study was done and it had the least amount of carbon of any comet studied. And it's either because it goes very close to the sun or it's been around for a while or it might have come from a different solar system. And if it did, it could have traveled for a billion years between that solar system and our solar system. So it's, it's just a very unusual comet, and the discovery was only a year after I found that one at uh, Big Bear. Um, only 173 hours, my goodness, one-tenth the time. Yeah. And and um, it started off just as a normal comet discovery. For the first three weeks or so, they just assumed a parabolic orbit. But as, they, as the professionals began to get more imagery and more positions for it they realize oh this is a periodic comet comes by every five years now for just just for our new listeners just explain the uh, parabolic or uh, orbit is comets that come in once and are gone and periodic are those that return after a period of years right under 200 years is a considered a periodic comet so uh, and it's inclined 60 degrees to the plane of the orbit so it doesn't spend a lot of time in in the plane of the orbit now, how many of your comets that you've discovered are periodic? Two of them, okay. and uh, the that's got to be that's got to be fun. That is every in fact. There's space that every two or three years, one of them comes back, yeah. and the other one and I discovered in 1994 uh, split up into five parts. I discovered it in, in I remember August that. of that year, and um, the moon became full. And as soon as the moon began to get out of the sky, people began imaging it in 1994. Amateurs had good imaging equipment, and they began finding all these components to it. Hmm. That's interesting. 
So what, what's in the future for you? Well, I hope to continue comet hunting as long as I can. Uh, you must someday. have a very understanding wife. I just have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. She encourages me to go out yeah. and, and come and hunt. And um, I hope to retire uh, someday, yeah. uh, perhaps within the next couple of years. Uh, we will probably be relocating to Arizona, and uh, I'll be comet hunting from there. Very good. So, uh, yeah, I, I plan to continue doing the comet hunting visually until... Until such point that, um, well, either I get tired of it or I'm physically unable to do it. I or don't think you're the type to get tired of it. You've done it a long time, <laughs> and you still, I still hear the enthusiasm in your voice. So it's, it's definitely something you love to do. Right. And, and I, I still think that for the foreseeable future, we can still pick them up. Three things have to occur for a person to discover a comet. This was my comet hunting theory I put together back in 1976 because I had this great program to discover comets. In 1975, I do 300 hours, and I read it took 300 hours to find a comet. Here's my 307 hours. Other people had found comets. Seven comets were found in 1975 by amateurs, and I didn't find any of them. So I thought, what am I doing wrong? So I, I, analyzed, I analyzed, I mean, I, no one probably had done more comet hunting than I had that right. year. But, you know, that's just the way it is. And I put together my comet hunting theory as to the, the three factors that must occur for you to be able to discover a comet. First is you have to be looking at the right place. And people laugh when you, when you say that, but there's 40,000 square degrees in the sky. If you were going to go out tomorrow and cover only 400 degrees or 1% of that, what, where would you cover? Right. North, south, west, east, high, low, you know. And you can cover one area and the comet may be in another area. So you've got to be in the right right place. Secondly, you've got to be at the right time. And uh, back in the early days, uh, they would leave the door open for comet discoveries for about 24 hours. So if I were to pick up a comet uh, this morning, uh, Dr. Marsden would allow about a day to go by to see if anyone else in the world would also pick it up independently. And if so, they would get their name on it. Um, nowadays, I think the window's not quite as wide. It might just be a few hours um, before they kind of close the door to any other discoveries coming in. It's that darn internet. <laughs> darn internet, yes. <laughs> And, and uh, we, we time it, too, with the moon. We want the moon to be right. more or less out of the sky, but my fourth comet was found with a 35% moon in the morning sky. Hmm. And I picked it up near Orion on August 6, 1988. And three days later, it was uh, a few days later, it was new moon. And then five Japanese comet hunters all picked it up on the same day. Um and, and they missed it because they weren't out when the moon was up. They waited till the moon was near new. So the, the moon controls in part when we go out, and that's part of the timing too. So you got to be looking at the right place. you got to be looking at the right time. Third is uh, like the fourth dimension, and, and that is distance or magnitude. The comet has to be bright enough for you to see it. And if it isn't, you sweep over it and you don't even know it's there and it will continue to brighten or dim or whatever or maybe be discovered by someone else. And it's the brightness factor that affects us most with these search programs because they go to 20th magnitude, 18th mm -hmm. magnitude, you know, they go much fainter than us. And so they can pick up the comet months before it moves in bright enough for us to see. They have a lead time of months or even a year before it gets bright enough for us to see it in most cases now if you have a comet with short perihelium distance it comes roaring in much more quickly and brightens up much more quickly especially in the final few months and those are the comets that we can still find visually i believe those with a perihelium distance of um, 0 0.6 0 0.5 0 0.4 they're in the sky and bright enough for long enough for us to see. They quite often can avoid the SOHO cameras uh, of the SOHO satellite 
which constantly monitors within mm-hmm. about 15 degrees of the sun. And yet they're, they can become bright enough for us to see visually. And those are the comets we're looking, I'm looking for. Well, what's the, what's the dimmest comet you discovered? Probably uh, 11.2 magnitude or so for my 10th comet discovery. That was um, with the six inch, <laughs> six inch reflector from my, from my back deck. So that's like at the limit of that telescope too. Yeah. Also, my the third one I found in 1994, known as 1994 R, uh, it was about 11 and a half. I used the 10 inch telescope for that, fairly high in the sky in the northern part of the sky, uh, and that's one of those comets that if I had not found, would not have been found. I think there's about three or four of my 11 discoveries. If I had not found them, they would never have been found. Wow. Wow, Don, <laughs> this is awesome. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, uh, I helped to develop the Messe Marathon, and that came from my comet hunting. I realized in 1978 or so, hey, you know, I, uh, I've become fairly good at finding faint, fuzzy objects near the horizon. And I you can find Messe objects. I keep track of everything I see. So I had log books of what I see and when I see it. And I thought it would be possible then maybe to do something where you could see as many of the Messe objects as you can, with the most difficult ones being those near the horizon, in uh, both after sunset and before sunrise. And I began to uh, discuss it, uh, put out a, uh, an article in 1978 in the San Jose Astronomical Association newsletter and said, let's do it in, in, in the spring of 79 put together an observing order, and we did it. We did one of the first West Coast. I recall Mar- that. And I've done 50, 52 Messe marathons, I think, since then. I uh, do them from memory for the last 15 years. I don't <laughs> use a star chart or anything. You just kind of know where they are. And um, I do it almost every year. I go out and do a Messe marathon. I've done it uh, different times of the year, too. Yeah, Messe, so last one, Messe yeah. objects for our listeners are... are um, objects that were cataloged a long time ago. I believe there's 110 of them. And uh, just so people would know, oh, this is not a comet. This is this is a galaxy or a cluster or a nebula or something like that in the sky. And there's a period of time during the year where you can see all ob- all Messier objects in one evening. And that's this is what you came up with, the plan to do that. Right, right. Late, late March uh, from, oh, probably... T- well, 15, 20 degrees north latitude to about 35, 37 degrees north latitude. You have about a week or two when you can see all 110 objects in one night. And you don't have to do that to do the marathon. Most of my marathons, I've seen 109. I've seen 110 probably uh, eight or nine times. But, uh, you know, you just go out there and do what you can. It's become a an event with many many different yes. astronomy clubs around the world yes. now do the Messe Marathon. Yeah, our local Ventura Club here does one every year, yeah, and they don't allow computer-controlled telescopes. <laughs> yes, the Ventura Club has been very good at organizing Messe Marathons, and uh, you guys had a, you've had awards and stuff for it every year, and you're very consistent and very faithful to doing those things, and uh, I've, I've recognized that that's one of the better clubs doing the Messe Marathon. Yeah, well, they they do an excellent job of it. That's very true. Yep, yep. that's great. So, how can people get a hold of you? Well, uh, my website is donmachholz.com, spelled D-O-N, and then M-A-C-H-H. There's two H's in that name. O-L-Z. <laughs> dot com. And uh, that's my website. They can also reach me through that website. And um, that's probably the best way to reach me. Okay. Well, Don, I really want to thank you for coming on the podcast. It was a pleasure talking to you. It's been a long time since we've chatted. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This, This was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Tim. It's been great talking with you today. Well, that'll do it for this episode of the Observer's Notebook Podcast. I again want to thank our special guest, Don Mackholtz. 
who came on today and told us a little bit about discovering comets, his, how he goes about searching for them, and some of those experiences in doing it. Thanks a lot, Don. It was a lot of fun. We upload a new episode of The Observer's Notebook every few weeks. You can subscribe to us on iTunes. If you do, please rate and review us. I really appreciate it. We're available on SoundCloud. The link is in the show notes. And also, anywhere else you can find a uh, podcast, we're there. Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever. You can support the podcast. If you enjoy what you hear on the podcast, you can donate to it. Uh, You can give as little as a dollar a month. For $5 a month, you get early access to the podcast. For $10 a month, you get a copy of the Novice Observer's Handbook. And for $35 a month, you'll receive a year's membership to the Association of Lunar and Planetary Observers and also producer credits on the podcast. And with that, I really want to thank the producer of this podcast, Steve Seidentop, for his continued generous support. Thank you very much, Steve. The link for Patreon, as well as the link for the ALPO, is in the show notes. If you'd like to get a hold of me, my email is cometman at cometman.net or on Twitter at ObserversNBPod. That's at ObserversNB, stands for notebook, pod. If you're interested in joining the ALPO, membership begins at only 14 bucks a year. You can find out more at www.alpo-astronomy.org. You can also find the ALPO on Facebook. Just up in that search field up on top, just type in ALPO Astronomy and you'll find our Facebook page. And the podcast also has a Facebook page as well. Just search for Observer's Notebook. The ALPO is an international organization devoted to the study of the sun, moon, planets, asteroids, meteors, and comets. Our goals are to stimulate, coordinate, and generally promote the study of these bodies using methods and instruments that are available to both the amateur and professional astronomers. Until next time, my hope is you always have clear and steady skies. Thank you very much for listening.